Hello everyone and welcome uh, to my talk at uh, Games uh, UR Summit 2022. I hope you're having a great conference so far and uh, are enjoying all the talks and the talks that are of course coming up. Um, today I'll be talking about the psychological concept of presence and how it can be used in practice in AAA games in forming a direction for uh, collaboration between game UX teams and uh, game design teams. So uh, quickly about me, I'm uh, Ahmed, I'm the UX director at Ubisoft Stockholm. I've uh, been making uh, UI in a professional, professional capacity for about 16 years now, half of which in desktop and mobile industries, and uh, most recently the past eight years or so in AAA games. Um, I've shipped games like Killzone, Horizon and uh, Battlefield, but also worked on games like Star Wars Battlefront 2. I'm uh, half of my career I spent kind of as a programmer and uh, the other half doing design and uh, uh, art. And now uh, I'm in a leadership position here at Ubisoft. Uh, my team has uh, programmers, designers, artists, uh, and scripters, so it has all kind of uh, disciplines that are needed to realize uh, game interfaces or user experiences. So uh, that's about me. Um, so in this talk, we're kind of going to be talking about how uh, game design teams can work together with UX uh, departments. And usually in AAA games, uh, the game design team or department uh, sets out a vision, a game design vision for the game. And we come in late to kind of apply our vision on top of that. And um, in this talk, uh, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, trying to kind of meld uh, these teams and, and cross the barriers. This is a problem that I've been, uh, I've witnessed uh, in the industry. Um, and I've been trying to uh, work on for the past uh, five years or so. So um, uh, I'm I was very fortunate that Ubisoft Stock Stockholm hired me early in the project. So I was able to collaborate with the game design team to um, set up a strategy like this uh, early on. Um, but um, so in this talk, I will talk about the learnings uh, that were um, um, uh, won from this uh, process. So I'll start by talking about presence and, and the concept of presence in psychology and how it applies to games. So in uh, part two, we will talk about game features and how they affect the presence, um, the game features that are might be in affinity with it or at contrast with it. Next, we will talk about the UI types that are generally used in 3D games in our industry. Um, and uh, after that, we will talk about the process uh, that uh, uh, can be used to um, enhance collaboration between game design and game UX teams. After that, we'll talk about some case studies. Uh, one is uh, from an existing game uh, called Ghost of Tsushima, uh, developed by uh, Sucker Punch Games. And another is a case study that I prepared for this talk, especially for this talk. And then in the end, we will hold a short recap to uh, discuss everything we've, we've talked about. So uh, first off, presence. Uh, and what is it? So presence is a term that was coined by Marvin Lee Minsky, the co-founder of the MIT AI lab. Uh, it was uh, coined by him in the 1980s and it uh, was defined by him as a psycho psychological state or subjective uh, perception in which part or all of the individual's current experience is generated by and or filtered through human-made technology. And what that roughly means is that presence is the effect that you feel when you're receiving stimulus, stimulus remotely. Uh, when communicating or interacting with remote agents. 
And those uh, remote agents can be either real or simulated. So uh, imagine, for instance, a phone call. If you are on the phone with a person and you close your eyes, you might get the feeling that you are in a room with them, speaking to them. And um, that is the feeling of presence. So in this case, it's a part of your experience. It's just an uh, auditory uh, uh, experience and uh, um, not your full experience. Uh, but it still gives you that feeling of, of, of presence, uh, like you're in a room with someone. That remote agent could be a friend that you're calling, but it could also be an AI you're speaking to that does not affect this feeling of presence. So um, it can still be experienced with uh, simulated or real agents. Um, a common mis misconception is that uh, the definition of presence all only applies to things like VR or very immersive experiences. That's not uh, true. It could also be um, a person uh, flying a drone on their phone, uh, if they uh, do that uh, and they get very uh, um, handy with it, they still feel like they are present. They're looking through the eyes of that drone and, and that's also that feeling. Uh, same goes for something like the Mars rover. Um, that feeling of presence can be felt by the scientists that are controlling the rover on Mars uh, using uh, something like a, a, a joystick. So. And, and again, this also applies to games. So even if you're playing something like a 3D game or a third person game, you can feel present in that world. So uh, this applies uh, to, to our uh, games a lot, 3D games. So um, another way to look at this is if the human experience is represented on this bar, so the full gamut of the human experience, and on one end is a very real experience. So imagine if you're pinched or punched. This is a very real experience that you feel. And uh, that's on one end of the spectrum. If on the other end you have a hallucination or a dream, or this is something you experience that is not real, but, but it can feel uh, very real uh, to people, a hallucination. So uh, if this is kind of the full gamut of the human experience, in the middle we have things that we call our virtual experiences. Um, and the study of presence in psychology kind of covers uh, this middle uh, gray area uh, in this gamut. And um, uh, I'm not an expert in this, but I implore you to, to uh, read up on it yourself. There's a lot of great uh, papers and, and uh, documents out there. Uh, so in this talk, I'm just going to be talking on about how game features can affect this feeling of presence um, in AAA games. So um, affinity and contrast. Uh, video games are, of course, a technology, and uh, there are things that can help the feeling of presence uh, when you're interacting with uh, a player character or an avatar, and there are things that can contrast with that. Um, so uh, in this section, I'm going to be showing a bunch of features. Um, first, uh, things that help the feeling of contrast uh, of, of uh, presence are things like RTX or ray tracing. Things like spatial audio, um, uh, low input latency, so so feeling very uh, close to the player character, or things technologies like VR help this a lot, of course. Of course, things like uh, uh, having a very high resolution uh, help in that, and things like force feedback as well, or motion controls, they can give that feeling like you're actually um, in a tactile way interacting with your uh, avatar. There are things that can be at contrast with the feeling of presence as, as well. Things like clipping. So if your uh, character model is clipping through the world or, or if your uh, screen is covered in, in very static HUD uh, elements that can be uh, uh, contrasting with the feeling of presence. Same goes to things that are that can be considered bugs, like screen tearing or 
uh, uh, foot sliding or input lag. Things like a disconnection or a difficulty spike can also be uh, considered uh, uh, at contrast uh, with the feeling of presence. Or things like a screen door effect that you feel when you're playing a low resolution uh, VR device. So these are all things that are can be uh, um, uh, in favor of the feeling of presence or contrast with it. And the, the, the reason why I didn't say uh, good or bad is because we can also by design uh, do something that is at contrast with it. So, so for instance, if there's a HUD element that is very important that we want to stand out, we can uh, show that uh, uh, in the middle of the screen, and that's that's a, a thing that is uh, in contrast with the feeling of presence, but it is uh, intentional to to draw the player's uh, attention. So that's why I use these terms instead of good or bad, for instance. So um, when we talk about the user experience or the types of UI that we can show uh, to kind of design the user experience, um, uh, in this section I want to talk a bit about the types uh, that are commonly used in uh, 3D games. So um, uh, there was a thesis called Beyond the Hut that was written uh, here in Stockholm at EA DICE. Um, um, and uh, it was written in 2009 by Eric and Magnus, two students. Um, and uh, they came up with a model uh, that maps whether uh, 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 an interface element is grounded in narrative against whether it is projected in 3D or not. And uh, you might have already seen this uh, before, but I will quickly uh, uh, go over this because I want to talk about these types of UI and how they affect the feeling of presence. So uh, the model, uh, as seen here, uh, maps UI uh, that is grounded in narrative, so the top two, meta and diegetic, that are grounded in narrative against um, um, whether the UI is projected in 3D space or uh, two-dimensionally onto the viewport. So. Um, I will quickly go over these uh, again. Bear with me if you've already seen this before, but um, for completion's sake, I would like to cover them quickly. So I'll start with uh, diegetic UI. So uh, examples of diegetic UI are uh, famously, for instance, uh, uh, Dead Space. This is a, a game that showed the player's health bar on the spacesuit, so you can see the health bar on the spinal column of the player character there, and things like uh, the ammo count holographically projected in front of the uh, player's avatar. Uh, also in racing games, you can see things like the speedometer uh, or the rev, rev counter, or uh, those are meters that are actually on the car uh, dashboard, and those, those can be considered diegetic uh, as well. Things like the motion detector in Alien Isolation is diegetic. It's actually uh, held by the player uh, and, um, in, in the game world. And uh, also things like uh, the ammo count in Halo, as you can see in the lower right here, uh, can be considered a diegetic UI. And this is something that is very uh, uh, good for uh, the feeling of presence. It, it is uh, in affinity with it. Next up, we can look at uh, a meta, U meta UIs or interfaces. Um, and here's, here follow some examples of that. Um, you can see, uh, for instance, um, in Call of Duty, when there's blood spatters around the screen, when the player is uh, low at health. And uh, that uh, is also grounded in narrative, but is uh, projected in 2D on onto the viewport. Um, Things like, uh, for instance, the vignette effect that you see in a game like Ace Combat that is indicative of pulling a lot of G-Force or, or uh, G-Lock, which is something that real pilots experience. They experience tunnel vision when they're under a lot of uh, G-Forces. Um, 
Another example can be the uh, bullet hole that you see here. Uh, this is a game called Lethal Enforcers, some of you might remember. Uh, this is also in narrative, but projected in 2D. Um, and uh, next we can talk a bit about spatial UI. So that is a, a UI that is projected in 3D space, but is not grounded in narrative. An example of that can be uh, seen here in the lower right, for instance. That's uh, The Last of Us, when the player is uh, in listening mode, they call it. So that's the, it kind of uh, implies that the player character can hear these uh, creatures around them. Another example here is, for instance, um, in uh, Assassin's Creed. If we show a, a health bar above an enemy, that is also a spatial UI. And finally, in a game like Forza, when they project statistics uh, uh, that belong to your car onto the car spatially, that's also uh, considered a spatial UI. And finally, uh, if you have 2D UI that is not grounded in narrative, for instance, uh, here are some examples from uh, Ghost of Tsushima and uh, uh, Destiny. These are all um, interfaces that are 2D and far removed from the 3D world or the narrative. So these can be considered uh, uh, um, at contrast with the feeling of presence. So uh, if we take these uh, types of UI and we map them uh, over the feeling of presence, so you can see here that uh, something like a diegetic UI is very close to that. Meta is kind of a step removed, still close to, uh, to, the, to the narrative of the world. And then uh, spatial UI follows that. It is um, UI that is projected into the 3D space. Um, and then finally, you have these uh, abstract uh, features that are uh, far removed uh, from the game's narrative and uh, 3D space. And uh, you can see what I've uh, done here is I've taken the liberty to map them onto the game loop. So uh, what that implies is that we can use diegetic UI uh, in the second to second experience or very close to gameplay and that that would be uh, beneficial um, uh, to the feeling of presence. Whereas uh, things like uh, abstract UI are uh, more at contrast, so we could uh, use them for features that might not be accessed often uh, by the player. So um, again, these are all tools in our uh, toolkit, so I'm not saying that one uh, is better than the other but they can be used for different applications and they're all uh, tools that we use. So uh, the idea is more to be deliberate and be balanced uh, as opposed to saying that uh, one is better than the other. So uh, I can uh, um, say uh, that often when you work with narrative teams, they want as much as they want, uh, as, as much as possible features to be uh, diegetically in the game. Uh, that, that might be very good for some things, but not good for other things that are maybe more information uh, dense. So again, it's about balance and being deliberate. So uh, next, I want to talk a bit about the process. Um, um, how to uh, to uh, work together with game design or, or as a UX department to kind of have this uh, um, um, unified uh, process. So often in, in uh, game projects, there are, there are uh, feature maps that are made by our producers. So they collect all the features that are designed or that, that uh, the directors identify and um, they create uh, epics on, uh, on uh, tools like Jira and um, those epics are split into features and then sub, uh, split into sub features like tasks. And um, uh, the, the process that I'm proposing here is to take this feature map and um, uh, workshop it. So start a, create a workshop together with 
uh, all the, the key stakeholders from the design departments and the UX departments early on in the, in the project, as early as possible, and a workshop uh, to kind of see what everybody thinks, uh, where a feature should land. Should it land in the second-to-second -second diegetic space, or is it a second-to-second -second feature like that needs to be diegetic or, or close to uh, uh, the feeling of presence, or is it something that uh, might be uh, more in the 30 minute loop of the game and just take post-its and place them together split the the feature maps that that the, the feature map that might be really large split it into parts and maybe form teams and uh, collect these post-its and discuss after together and when you've done that uh, uh, a workshop like that everybody feels heard and everybody feels like they've put their input and again uh, some features might land in multiple buckets, that is fine too. And uh, what can be done after a workshop like that is we can take all these features and spread them out on an artifact like this, uh, or in four buckets. Uh, diegetic being the one that is uh, closest to the feeling of presence, of course, and abstract being the one that is furthest away. And what we can do is make this artifact and discuss it together and see is this all deliberate uh, are there features that land in multiple buckets and is that on purpose um, do we have an even spread uh, uh, among these buckets is there maybe one that is under underutilized uh, does that mean that we need to scrap it or does that mean that we can use that to make features stand out more these are all uh, uh, dialogues that can be held between uh, UX designers and uh, game designers and can be very beneficial to both teams. What also can be done is we can collect the top two buckets and send them to the narrative team after some uh, number crunching. So look at these features and, and what kind of information do these features in the top two buckets need to convey? Is it all things that are uh, normalized? So, so like health bars uh, that can be shown on bars or dials, or are they all features that uh, uh, communicate uh, uh, or, or convey information using text or numbers? And uh, w when you do an exercise like that, you can kind of make broad requirements that can be sent over to the narrative team that can help them uh, ground these things in narrative and, and make it easier to to, to, to make uh, to design narrative features that uh, uh, help convey these uh, uh, types of information. So these are all ways why uh, uh, how this can be very helpful and uh, discussions like this held early can form a very cohesive direction between the game design teams and the UX teams. So um, next I'm going to be talking a bit about a couple of case studies. One of them is Ghost of Tsushima. Uh, they have a feature called Guiding Winds that is very interesting and that kind of uh, uh, touches on this uh, uh, process that, that I've talked about. And then next we will kind of take a game with a very small feature map and design it from the ground up and, and see how we can uh, apply this process on, um, an, on a new game. So uh, first off, Ghost of Tsushima. Uh, Ghost of Tsushima was uh, developed by Sucker Punch, uh, Sony uh, Studios, uh, PlayStation Studios, a very great game. and, and uh, I, uh, um, for the people that haven't played it, I advise uh, picking it up. It's uh, really a, an amazing experience. And Ghost of Tsushima have, has this uh, feature called Guiding Wind. And this is a feature uh, that is used to uh, convey locations in the world or direction in the world uh, to the player. So. Traditionally, in 3D games, uh, we use location markers on the HUD to show where the player needs to go. So whether that is a quest objective or we have a landmark in the world that we want to highlight or uh, show the player. 
So we use uh, location markers on the HUD, and usually those are uh, either spatial or abstract markers that we uh, show on, on, the, on the screen. And uh, what Ghost of Shima did uh, very great is they have taken this feature and made uh, a diegetic feature called Guiding Wind, which is this uh, beautiful wind that flows uh, in the direction of where the player's next objective is. And uh, all the particles, like snow particles in the world, or leaves, or uh, even the clothes that the player uh, character is wearing, um, uh, kind of flow in that wind to show you where, where you need to go. And uh, they still use uh, spatial uh, location markers, but they only show them uh, when you are closer to that objective, so within 50 meters range of that objective. So what they've done is they've taken something uh, that is a location marker that is that could be very uh, jarring to the player or can uh, be at contrast to the player's feeling of presence, and they've taken that uh, close uh, to the feeling of uh, presence, which is really great. And um, I've taken some screenshots so you can see uh, those lines of wind flowing around the player and uh, all the snow and, and the foliage and, and the clothes and, and even the horse's tail all flow in the direction of the wind. And that is uh, guiding us to this undiscovered location. And when the player gets closer, so when they get to within uh, 50 meters range, then this spatial uh, HUD marker shows up uh, that shows kind of uh, where the player needs to go when they're close to their objective. And, and this is a very great uh, way to kind of keep the player uh, grounded in the narrative and close to that feeling of presence, uh, grounded in this beautiful world um, that is uh, Tsushima. So, um, that's a very good case study to look at. Uh, and uh, a good question would be like, are there other features uh, besides the location marker that can be promoted up uh, in this way? And this is a question that I'll uh, leave to your teams to, to kind of think about. And it's a, it's a very good uh, um, uh, thought experiment to have while you're analyzing your own game that you're working on. So, uh, that's a game that exists or, or, or a feature that already exists out there. Um, another way is to take uh, a game from the ground up and try to apply this process to uh, design it in a, in a, to have the best experience possible. And what I've done here is I've taken um, uh, um, a, a game, an example. Uh, I've made an example for this talk that uh, um, I named Gruxbot, and it's a, a 3D uh, game uh, where I've taken a small set of features that are very common to 3D game experiences, and I've uh, tried to apply this process to show how that would map out. So here you can see uh, the feature map. So you can see that uh, most 3D games uh, have uh, health systems or incoming threat detector, detector, detection uh, uh, HUDs. For instance, if, if, if you have a third person game, that you can be attacked from off screen. Uh, things like low health warnings that we've seen before in Call of Duty, shields or skill trees, and of, of course also uh, loot systems. These are all systems that, that uh, can be seen in 3D games. And we can take um, a feature map like this and workshop it, and, and here is an example of how uh, the result, results could look from a workshop like this. So you can see I've taken the, the systems that apply more to the second-to-second -second experience, and I've uh, um, uh, put them in the diegetic bu bucket, and things that are maybe more removed, like a skill tree that you see maybe every 30 minutes while playing a game when you level up. Uh, and put that in the abstract uh, uh, UI type or uh, interface type. And uh, so a feature map like this uh, can be workshopped and, and results like this can be shown 
on an artifact like we've shown before. So you can see the health and the shield and the second to second systems are uh, way up top. And things like the skill tree are in the bottom. And we can take these top two buckets and um, pass them over to the narrative department and, and, and work with them and see how we can ground uh, these in the game. And, and what I've done here is I've uh, made a couple of screenshots uh, for this fictional game so that we can see how something like that could map out. So um, welcome to Gruxbot, uh, made for this presentation. Press start to continue. And um, so uh, here you can see uh, the game world. It's just an empty world for now. And uh, you see our player character um, as designed by our 3D artists. And we can take something like the health system and put that on the capacitors that are on the back of this robot, like so. And you can see that um, we can use these capacitors to indicate the level of health. Maybe uh, every few hits or so, a capacitor like that falls off uh, the player model and until uh, the player uh, uh, is dead. And, and, and this can be used to kind of uh, convey this. Uh, similarly to, to games like Dead Space, we can take the shield system and uh, apply that to the shields on the robot. Maybe they dim as, as the player takes damage or they fall off as well. And, and this is a, 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 a way to show them uh, diegetically as well. Something like an incoming threat system can be shown on the uh, antenna. And again, this is uh, something that can be discussed between the narrative teams and the 3D teams. This antenna can be added to show directionality or it can show uh, that uh, uh, the player might get attacked from uh, off screen. Next, we can take something like a low health warming uh, warning, like uh, a game like Call of Duty, and we can show that grounded in narrative, but uh, projected in 2D onto the screen. So maybe this is how the robot sees the world uh, and, and, and how that could glitch when the uh, robot is uh, low at health. Uh, something that is maybe less common that can be at the end of every encounter, not during an encounter, uh, is something like a loot system. We can show that spatially. Uh, so we can show uh, loot boxes or things that uh, you can loot in the world uh, projected into the 3D space uh, in an abstract uh, uh, interface, or sorry, a spatial interface projected in 3D. And uh, finally, we can take something like a skill tree that uh, maybe is seen every 20 minutes uh, when uh, the player levels up, and we can show that in an abstract manner. So these are all ways we can take uh, a feature map like that and then design for it after we've held this workshop. Uh, another great way to use uh, um, a process like this is to take uh, a game that you've made um, that uh, might be in a playtest and using either telemetry data or a screen recording, we can kind of see how much time the player spends uh, in each uh, realm or UI type as they are playing the game. So, so what I've done here is I've taken um, uh, the, um, or made a fictional kind of uh, a scenario of a playtest where I've taken each of these uh, interfaces or, or interface features and uh, mapped them to a score and then averaged them out to see kind of uh, when does a player, uh, how much time does a player spend in each uh, zone or how often uh, do these features come back. And you can see here, this is kind of an, an idealized uh, playtest of 30 minutes, or this is how uh, something like that could look. And an artifact like this can be very useful to verify your intended design. So is, is this uh, really uh, playing out the way it was designed or not? Or do we have, for instance, a, 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 a spatial feature that sh is showing up more often than uh, every uh, 10 or so minutes. 
And in that case, we can uh, see whether we want to promote that or uh, whether that uh, feature can be uh, changed to be uh, closer to um, the feeling of presence of the player. But an, an, an artifact like this can be made using either telemetry data or even with a screen recording and a stopwatch <laughs> or something. So this is uh, can be very useful when analyzing your game as well. So uh, to quickly uh, recap uh, everything we've talked about uh, before we kind of uh, go over to questions. We've talked about presence and uh, uh, the concept of presence in psychology and kind of how that applies to video games and technology, uh, the definition um, of it. And then we've talked about affinity and contrast in games and, and how features can affect this feeling of presence. Next, we've talked about the UI types uh, and how uh, they affect the feeling of presence. So we have diegetic features that are maybe uh, very close to it and um, uh, abstract features that are uh, at contrast with it. So we've talked about these UI, ty UI types and, and what they are and, uh, and how they affect the feeling of presence. And then after that, we talked about the process. So we've shown how to uh, uh, look at feature maps and how we can create workshops uh, that are uh, attended by both game designers and UX designers to, to uh, map out how our uh, game is going to look and, um, and how we're going to create these buckets to collect requirements for them um, that can be passed on to the narrative team or to other teams that uh, might need to build them. And then next we've uh, looked at some case studies one was from the Guiding Wind feature from Ghost of Tsushima, which I recommend everybody play. Uh, it's a really great uh, game, and this feature was really well made by uh, Sucker Punch, so please uh, take a moment to play that game. And then we've talked about uh, Gruxbot and, and this uh, case study that I've made for this uh, talk. And finally, uh, how to measure it or how to kind of analyze playtests uh, in your game. So uh, thank you very much for listening. I, I really hope you enjoy this talk and it can help you in your process. And I hope uh, you've enjoyed it. I hope you enjoy all the other talks in the conference as well. There have been some. There are some amazing speakers uh, um, this time around. So I'm very fortunate uh, to be here. Thank you very much for listening. And uh, we'll open it up to any questions uh, that you might have. Again, uh, thank you very much. <laughs>